to the book of Esther. We're going to be in Esther 4 today. Esther 4, 1 through 17. And, and we'll kind of hit on that today and next week a little bit as well. And if you haven't been here, I'll, I'll kind of give you a recap here. But the, the big idea as we get into Esther 4, 1 through 17, is, is we're going to look at the story of Mordecai and Esther and see how they're not perfect in, in any way, shape, or form, in fact. And despite, you know, you might have heard... You might have experienced this. I experienced this. When I was a young child and I would go to Sunday school, you'd get kind of this moralization of the stories of the Bible. And, and, and it would make people sound better than they actually were. So if that was your experience in Sunday school or, or vacation Bible school, or maybe you studied it in a course or a Bible study or something, um, that's often not the case. One of the things I like to point out as we read Scripture, there's, there's two ways to read the Bible effectively. And one way is a a religious way to read it, where you see there's bad people, and then you see good people, and you say, I don't want to be like the bad people, I want to be like the good people, right? Well, that is a way to read the Bible, but I don't think that's the right way to read the Bible. I think the proper way to read the Bible is actually to look at it and see the gospel and say, there are bad people, and then there's Jesus. And I fit into the category of bad people, regardless of how good or bad I may be, I still fit into that category. And I don't want to be like the better people in the Bible. I want to be like Jesus. That's who I want to be like. And so as we read that and as we see that and we keep that in mind, when we get to Esther 4 here today, it's kind of like a hinge. The whole story pivots here in Esther 4. It it kind of takes a swing here. And we see finally, as we're going through this book of Esther, they start to make a little bit of progress here. And at this point in the story, Esther's been married to Xerxes now for five years years. And the reason it doesn't tell us anything about those five years is because really in that time, nothing had happened. Not a lot of progress was made. But then all of a sudden we get here to Esther 4 and uh, for both Esther as well as Mordecai, her uncle slash adoptive father, uh, things start to progress all of a sudden. And, And for those of you who maybe haven't felt like you're progressing spiritually for a while, Um, this hopefully will be a story that's a little bit of encouragement and hope for you today. Um, For those of you who are already making some progress spiritually, um, that's great. But if you're you're ever, you know, in that time, in that place, in that stage, and and even as a pastor, we have dry spells. All of us spiritually do. And when when you reach those points where you just don't feel like you're moving the ball forward, don't get discouraged. And don't judge yourself in those moments by some standard of perfection that that isn't achievable for any of us instead look at the journey that's one of the things that i've learned spiritually speaking in my process as i've grown as a christian over the years we do hit spots where it doesn't feel like we're moving and we may not be moving but i'm slowly still making progress i'm trying to become more and more christ-like each and every day each and every year some days are better than others right But are you making progress? Where are you at with that? Well, here's where we begin today. We're going to look at Mordecai first. And it takes him a while to get moving forward spiritually in this story. And as I said, we will see Esther gets moving today as well. Just to summarize how we got here briefly. um, If you don't know who Mordecai and all these folks are, the beginning of the story is a guy by the name of King Ahasuerus who we know better as King Xerxes by his Greek name, uh, comes into power of this grand and great kingdom, extends basically from Pakistan to Greece, into northern Africa, down into India. At the time, the largest, largest coverage of any king in the entirety of the world. So he's, he's kind of a big and important kind of guy, right? And so he's one of the characters. He boots his, his wife, a uh, queen by the name of Vashti, kind of has a bachelorette kind of audition, ends up bringing in Esther as his new queen. And then um, there's this plot that is heard by the man by the name of Mordecai. Mordecai is Esther's uncle as well as her adoptive father. Mordecai hears at the city gates that somebody's going to try to kill the king. And so Mordecai passes along to Esther. He says, hey, tell the king somebody's going to try to take him out. They do a little investigation. Sure enough. True. Absolutely true. The two guys who are trying to kill the king, they get killed. Right? That's what happens when you try to kill the king. So they get killed. 
Now you think at this point, Mordecai, as the guy who passes on this information, he's going to get a reward. You know, golden chariot. Maybe he gets those, you know, the, the, the platinum-plated sundial for his wrist. or I don't know what. What do you give when somebody saves your life and you're the king? But in this case, rather than giving Mordecai anything, instead, the king gives a, a rank advancement to this other guy by the name of Haman. And nothing comes for Mordecai. Haman the Agagite, in fact. And, and if you don't know your Old Testament history, the Agagites are kind of the mortal enemies of, of the Israelites. When Israel was formed, when the people of God took and took the land and became the nation of Israel instead of just the Jews, the very first people who attacked them were the Agagites. And so for, for a long, 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 long time, the Agagites were the enemy of the Israelites. And so this is kind of an interesting plot twist that... Here we know that Esther and Mordecai are Jews, and Mordecai saves the king, and then all of a sudden, this guy who's the enemy, he gets the promotion. Doesn't seem fair. And that kind of brings us up to where we're at. So like I was saying, Mordecai finally kind of gets things in gear here. He begins to make some spiritual progress. If you want to follow along, Esther 4, 1 through 3. And it says, when Mordecai had learned all that had been done, um, now, you know, at this point, everything is out of control, because Haman... This guy who got the promotion has decided, as we heard last week, that he wants to exterminate all of the Jews in the entirety of the kingdom of King Xerxes. So when, when Mordecai had learned of this, Mordecai tore his clothes, it says, and he put on sackcloth and ashes. And he went out into the midst of the city, and he cried out with loud and bitter cries. This is a, a, a public mourning, right? A, a public weeping. This is also kind of a bit of a, a public protest. There's been a decree that was set out by Haman, a, a death sentence for, for all of the Jews and all of the land that has been put into effect. They put a date on it. They said, on this day, we are going to exterminate all of the Jews who live in our land. The date has been set. And, and Mordecai is just, he's got like a low-level government job, right? He's powerless to affect change in this. But he's going to protest. And so he's going to publicly now, finally, for the very first time in the story, identify himself with God's people. If you know the story, you'll remember, he told Esther when she became queen, by the way, don't tell anybody we're Jews, right? He said, kind of keep that quiet. And so at this point in the story, up until this point, he's only privately been counted among God's people. But right now at this point, I said it's kind of a hinge. He's going to go from, from silent to speaking finally. He's going to go from being passive to being active. And we're seeing him finally begin to make some progress. Up until this point, he's not been walking faithfully with God. You see, he's living far away from Jerusalem. They're like 700 miles by foot away from Jerusalem. And, and what that matters is they were supposed to be living in Jerusalem. He and his family and, and a bunch of Jews, when they had the opportunity, when they were freed out of the Babylonian exile, to go back to Jerusalem, they looked around and said, nah, we kind of like our life here, we're going to stay here. But the problem with that is if you're a Jew, you were supposed to live in Israel. You were supposed to be able to go to the temple and make your offerings and go there for worship and, and do those sorts of things. And you can't do that when you're living in the town of Susa. So, they, they, they are disobedient and they're living far off from God when they're living here in Susa. He's far from Jerusalem. We've never seen him offer up prayers. We, we've not seen Mordecai reading of the scriptures. Nothing, nothing in the story to this point has indicated at all that at any point is he walking with God in any way. He's not making sacrifices, nothing. And so he's been very, very passive. And he comes off as kind of a cowardly, timid man who, who instead worships comfort and convenience rather than God. But now, finally, he gets active. And, and for those of us who've maybe been in that same situation, there's hope for us who've been passive, right? There's hope for us who've been cowardly in our faith. There's, there's hope for us who've been silent at times. There's hope here in this story. Mordecai finally gets active. And he starts making some spiritual progress. And he does so in a very public way. And he does it, interestingly, through mourning. It says in Scripture that he went up to the entrance of the king's gate, for no one was allowed to enter the king's gate 
clothed in sackcloth. Sackcloth is effectively like if you took a burlap bag and you made clothes out of it. Not comfortable, right? And, th- and that was on purpose. It was to display that you were mourning. And, and, and as we see here, it says no one was allowed to enter the king's gate in sackcloth. Only happy people get to go and see King Xerxes. This is a guy with a huge ego, right? Mordecai is not allowed uh, into the entrance of the palace because he's grieving, because he's wailing, because he's mourning. He can't go in. Not allowed. And it says there in Scripture, and in every province, in verse 3, where, wherever the king's command and his decree reached, there was great mourning among the Jews, with fasting and weeping and lamenting. Many of them, it says, lay down in sackcloth and ashes. Now let me say one thing briefly, pastorally, pastoral, pastorally speaking, practically speaking. In America, in our Western culture, and particularly among us men, I I fit into this category, we don't grieve well. We don't, right? The Bible, in the Old Testament particularly, is kind of more of the the Eastern culture rather than our our more familiar Western culture. In in the Old Testament, when something bad would happen, they would lament, they would mourn, they, they would let you know, right? They would change their clothes. They, they would put ashes on their head. You know, they'd go to the fire pit and smear it all over their face so you could see that they were mourning. They'd go out in public. They'd, they'd scream, they'd cry, they'd wail. Um, the, the Psalms, if you read through the Psalms, numerically speaking, most of the Psalms are Psalms of lament. They're, they're words and songs of, of prayer for God's people to express their grief, their sadness, their pain, their hardships to God. But here in America, we don't do that very well a lot of times, right? I mean, this is how it often goes, right? Hey, how are you doing? Oh, fine. How are you? Oh, I'm fine. We're both fine. Great. Have a nice life. Woo, see you later, right? And then we go our separate directions. Well, meanwhile, he's getting a divorce. She's got cancer. They're fine, right? Wrong. They're not fine. And here's a couple of reasons why learning to mourn and being honest is good. And letting people know, it's okay to let people know, man, I'm in a hard season of life right now, right? Things aren't going well. Here's what's happening. Pray for me. Be there for me. That's, That's what we're called to do as God's people, right? is to be honest with one another, to support one another, to love one another. And we can't do that if we don't share in mourning and we're not honest with one another. We have to become better at sharing with family and friends and prayer groups and church members and the people in our lives about what is actually going on in our lives. It's not just, how are you doing? Fine, fine. Okay, fine. See you later. Fine. That's, that's not real. That's not life. That's not the way it's supposed to be. I mean, the Bible says, thou shalt not lie, right? If you're not fine, don't tell me you're fine. Okay? If all, all you ever say is, oh, I, I'm great. Yeah, life is good. <laughs> sure. But you're melting down on the inside. You're lying, right? And so we want a culture where it's okay to say, no, I'm struggling. I'm hurting physically, emotionally, mentally, financially, whatever the case may be. Tell the truth. Be honest. Be vulnerable. That's the part that we're not good at, is the vulnerability part, right? We don't like to admit we need help. We don't like to say we are weak. We have this rugged individualism as Americans that tells us, have pride and take care of it yourself. That's not how God designed us to be. So... We need to learn to be better at being honest with one another. Tell the truth. And the second thing within this is, as we look at this, and we talk about mourning, lamenting, we see throughout Scripture, God Himself weeps. We see this as early as Genesis 6. It's just that God was grieved in His heart that He made man. We see Jesus himself weeping over Jerusalem, right? God weeps. God expresses sadness. When Jesus' good friend Lazarus dies, right? The very shortest verse in the entirety of the Bible simply states, Jesus wept. Lamenting. Crying. 
crying out, singing out to God, doing so with others, is, is like a release valve. It releases some of that, that pressure of your life. It doesn't take away the problems, but it helps us work our way through it. We don't have to walk it alone. And as a church, let me, let me encourage you, it's good to learn to grieve together. And grieving together is actually an act of worship, just as much as singing and rejoicing is. The Bible says that, that God rejoices with those who rejoice, and He weeps with those who weep. And God's people similarly need to rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep as well. We are called to that. Now back to our story here. As I said, Mordecai, finally, his faith is starting to get going. And it's, it's in this activation time of, of mourning, of weeping, where he finally gets onto his spiritual game. And here's the big idea. Faith is an internal conviction that leads to an external action. Faith is not just what you believe, but it's how you behave. I mean, sometimes you can really tell what somebody believes by what they do, right? Let me give you an example. I remember this one quite well as a parent. We would go to the pool, right? And you'd have this little boy standing on the edge of the pool. He's got his swim diaper on, right? And a tiny little guy. He's standing there. We're, we're not in very deep water, but he's standing there on the edge of the pool. And, and, and this has played out millions of times, right? I'm standing there, or you're standing there. Our arms are open. We're trying to encourage our child to jump in the pool, right? Jump. Come on in, buddy. It's great. Come here. Jump. And you see that, to that, that toddler, that child, just standing there on the edge, right? Now, some children have no inhibitions, and they just run and leap, even without a parent there, right? I have a, a cautious son. And so he stands there, and he'll look at me. He'll think about it, and he'll look at me. Does he trust me enough to take the action? Will he take that leap of faith? Will he jump into the arms of his father? You see, faith is not just what you believe, it's how you behave. And we know that child trusts that parent if they do what? If they jump, right? If the kids jump, they trust their dad or mom or whoever it is. Faith is demonstrated in action. We were just talking about weddings a moment ago. You go to a wedding, right? I remember my wedding. I, uh, we, we, we got walked out as men with a bagpiper. We wore kilts in my wedding. I have photographic evidence if you don't believe me. <laughs> I do own a kilt. And so we walked out, and we stand there at the front of the church. And I walk out in faith believing that my bride will be coming, right? But I have to take the action. I have to take the first step. I had to go out there and stand there and wait. Being there as a bride and groom, that is an act of faith. And then the two of us, or the two of them, as was last night or last week, and standing there, holding hands, looking at one another, committing to something they don't even know what they're getting involved in, right? It's faith. And each of them is saying to one another, as they give their vows, I trust you. And everybody who's there gets to see it. Because faith is demonstrated in what you do. So with Mordecai, Something changes in him at this point in the story. And it starts with him in this mourning, in this grieving, in this lamenting. So the, the question for you to think about is, where have you been passive and need to get active in your faith? See, nobody knew he was a believer. Now everybody knows he's a believer. He was silent, and now he's speaking very publicly. He was passive. Now he's at the gates to the king's palace. And he's active. He's making some progress finally. 
For you, where have you been passive and you need to get active? You might say, you know, yeah, I know I should read my Bible, but I don't, right? Well, then get active. Start reading it. You might say, oh, yeah, you know, I, I know we're supposed to pray, Pastor, but I just, I really don't pray much. Well, then get active and start praying. You might say, oh, I, I know, Pastor, we're called to serve others, but I just haven't. I haven't, I haven't been active. I haven't been involved. Maybe today's your chance to be inspired, to get plugged in, and to be part of that. What opportunities has God given you for progress? Avail yourself to them and and let God's grace show up in your life to help you make progress. That's the story of Mordecai. Well then, what about Esther? Well, Esther 2 has an opportunity to make some progress. Verse 4 4. When, when Esther's young, uh, let me try this again. When Esther's young women and her eunuchs came and told her what was happening with Mordecai, it says that the queen was deeply distressed. Here's what's going on outside of the palace she's insulated. She's inside in like this perfect bubble, right? She's married to the richest guy, the most powerful guy in all of the world, has anything she could ever possibly want for the most part, but probably doesn't know all that well what's going on in the world around her. And just outside of the gates of her palace, this guy Haman, he's decided to be the predecessor to Hitler, right? And commit genocidal holocaust on millions of Jews throughout the land. And meanwhile, Esther's living in the palace with no idea. So word comes into Esther, they're going to kill your cousin, they're going to kill your adoptive father plus all of the other Jews. So she has a crisis, right? But her crisis becomes an opportunity. For many of us, that is actually the case. A crisis actually can become an opportunity. Most of the time, where where we make great leaps and bounds, big steps, big gains spiritually, where we really progress spiritually, actually comes out of a season of suffering and duress. Oftentimes, our opportunities for the greatest spiritual growth come at the hardest times of our lives and the most desperate seasons of life. And here Esther learns there's a crisis. And so what it says is, so she sent garments to clothe Mordecai so that he might take off his sackcloth. But then it interestingly says, but Mordecai wouldn't accept these clothes that she sent him. And that might sound a little weird to us. Let me explain what's happening. See, she hasn't really been much in contact with Mordecai. She's been married now for five years to Xerxes. And she's been living in the palace, and he's out working, doing what he does with the government out in the city of Susa, and they're kind of going their own way, right? Now all of a sudden he shows up at the front gate, and he's he's weeping, he's wailing, he's mourning, he's protesting, ashes on his face, he's wearing sackcloth, right? And he's he's starting to get a little traction with his complaints out there, and, and people are starting to notice that, hey, this guy keeps showing up every day, and he's wailing, and he's whining, and he's moaning, and he's groaning, and what's going on here, right? And so... She hears of this finally. And she sends word and says, Hey, I, I want to meet with you, but you, you can't come dressed like that. So here's some clothes, right? What does he say? I'm not going to come in. It's not time yet. It's, too pre- it, it, it's premature. It's, we're, it's not, it's, I can't leave what I got going here. I'm finally getting some traction, right? People are starting to pay attention. The crowds are starting to show up. They're starting to, to hear our complaint. We're starting to finally hear that we're saying, please don't murder us all. Right? It's too early for me to stop this and pick up this relationship with you again. So he says no. And scripture tells us, then Esther called for Hathach, one of the king's eunuchs, who had been appointed to attend to her, and ordered him to go to Mordecai to learn what was going on, to learn what was happening and why it was, why he wouldn't come in. And Hathach went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate. So this was something that's very public. And Mordecai told him of all that had happened to him and about the exact sum of money. You see, Haman had promised King Xerxes, 
I am going to fill your bank full if you'll let me exterminate the Jews. I'm going to take all of their stuff after we kill them. I'm going to sell it and give you half of the money from the proceeds. Right? King Xerxes is like, well, I'm rich, but that sounds pretty sweet. Free money. All right. So Haman had promised to pay into the king's treasuries, as it says, for the destruction of the Jews. Make no mistake, behind all of this, this is demonic. Satan always wants to destroy God's people. He just does, right? He does this with sin in the garden. He does this with Sodom and Gomorrah. He does it in Egypt with Pharaoh. He does it in Babylon with the exile. He does it here in Susa with Xerxes. It's why Herod tried to destroy the baby Jesus. It's why there was persecution in the early church as we read the book of Acts. It's why there's still martyrdom even to this day in this Christian era. Uh, our, our war, our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against powers, principalities, spirits, against Satan and, and demons and, 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 and this power that, that wants to destroy the people of God is real and it's there. And so we have... Two kingdoms colliding here. You have, you have darkness declaring war on light. And so it says then, at this point, Mordecai gave Hathach a copy of the written decree that was issued in Susa for the destruction of the Jews, that he might show it to Esther and explain it to her and command her to go to the king and beg his favor and to plead with him on behalf of her people. And then Hathach went and told Esther exactly what Mordecai had said. Mordecai is now finally active in his faith. He's making progress. And this messenger is sent to the servant who has access to Esther. And he says, tell her Haman is going to kill all of us. Haman's paid off the king for the privilege of doing it on top of it. And it's going to happen soon. The day has been set. It's on their calendar. Tell Esther to do something. Tell Esther to say something. And here's the key at this point in the book. Esther has up to this point been completely passive as well, not active. She's been silent, not speaking. Others have made her decisions for her. She's not been making decisions for herself. And, and it's easy for us to look at the circumstances of our lives and say, oh yeah, well, this is just out of my control, Pastor. I, I, I can't change it. This is so big and I'm so small and I just don't have the power. I don't have the authority. The, the current of my life is so strong that it's just pulling me in this direction. I'm just a, a little leaf floating in this river and there, there's not much I can do, right? Esther appears exactly like that up until this point in the story. Just floating along. Everything's happening around her. Decisions are made for her. People speaking on her behalf. She's not active. She's not been making progress spiritually. And there's no indication up until this point that she's prayed or she's read scripture, she's, that she's worshipped with God's people in any way, not offered any sacrifices, none of those kinds of things, nothing. And again, she is like so many of us. She knows the things to do, but hasn't been doing them. She's been keeping her faith very private with whatever level of faith that she had. Nobody knows that Esther is among God's people. It's a secret. And she doesn't want her life to be inconvenienced. And Mordecai informs her, remember, let's not tell them that we are Jews. Let's just try to fit in, go with the flow, right? How many of you, that's your story? Something maybe happened, and, and now you're in that difficult, complicated, hard place, and you've just kind of been floating along, right, spiritually. Maybe today is the day that you'll hear this, and you need to get active. Maybe it's the day that you say, yeah, you know, I believe in God, but, oh, I really haven't been public with it, and I haven't really been doing much with it, and... Maybe today is the day you just start committing yourself. I'm going to be more active in my faith. I'm going to be more public with my faith. I'm going to be open about who it is that I am. Maybe it's time to say something. Maybe it's time to take a stand when, when you're somewhere and people are telling those jokes that you know aren't the right jokes, right? And usually you just kind of quietly laugh over to the side so you fit in. Maybe it's your day to go, guys, I don't think we should be talking about this. Right? tough place to be. I've been there. But it's maybe time for us to get moving. 
Now let's be reasonable with Esther. And she's been born far away from all the other devout Jews, right, who have been living over in Israel now. She's kind of part of this not-so-devout group. They're living in Susa. They're part of this disobedient group. Isaiah had given a command to Israel from God that they were supposed to go back, but these guys didn't. Her parents had died. So she's an orphan girl. She's probably been poor all of her life. Mordecai is probably not the guy ever getting the Dad of the Year award, right? And so she kind of starts off life maybe not in the best place. She's got a number of things stacked against her. But the thing is, she does nothing to move the ball forward, right? Sometimes when you play football, football is a game of field position. If you can get the ball at the 50-yard line every time, you're probably going to win the game. If you get the ball at your two-yard line and the goal is right behind you, and that's where you get the ball every time, you're going to struggle to win. And so maybe she got the ball at the two-yard line. But if you play football, you know, what's our first priority? Just start to move that ball forward a couple of yards, right? And if we can get two, three, four yards, maybe this play, we might get two, three, four yards the next play. Maybe we'll get a first down, right? We wind up having a safety or a fumble in the end zone, and they'll score a touchdown. And so maybe she started off in a tough place in life. Maybe that's your story too. But it's, are you making progress? Are you moving the ball forward? Are you getting things going. And Mordecai is finally saying to Esther, let's get moving. Let's make some progress. And here's the truth. Some of you, your, 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 your family, your friends, the, the people you spend time with, maybe you're with a group of people, you're just kind of stuck, right? But here's the deal. Change happens one person at a time. Maybe if you start getting things going, maybe it'll inspire your wife or your kids or your neighbor or your coworker. Who knows how God can use it? But somebody has to start, and that somebody should be you. You can help motivate the other people in your life to get going. You just have to get going yourself. And so Mordecai gets going here. And he's going to be encouraging Esther to do the very same thing, to start making some spiritual progress. So here's the next question for you. What opportunity has God given you today to make some progress? Today. There's a sense of urgency in the scriptures here. And there should be a, a similar sense of urgency in our own lives. You might say, oh yeah, pastor, it's on my to-do list to do more spiritually. It's, it's been on my to-do list to read the Bible. It's, it's on my to-do list to pray. It's on my to-do list to serve. It's on my to-do list just to give or whatever it might be. That's not what God wants. God doesn't want to be on your to-do list. He wants to be the center of everything in your life. Not somewhere on this ranked to-do list. Not something that is completed, but something that is constant, that affects every aspect of our lives. So what is it for you? Maybe the Holy Spirit speaking to you today, telling you something. Is it time to start reading the Bible again? Is it time to start confessing sin? Is it time to start praying? Is it time to pursue relationships with other godly people? Maybe you've been hanging out with the wrong crowd. Maybe it's time to find some new people to have friendships and opportunities with. It's a time to serve and use your gifts. It's a time to reorder your budget, to reorder your schedule so that you can spend more time with God and God's people. It's a time to take from being internally faithful to externally faithful and public about what you believe. What is it for you? God calls all of us to be faithful. He will give us opportunities if we will pursue it. So this week as you go, look for it. Find ways to be active and involved. Take charge of your faith. Don't put it on a to-do list. Just do it. That's what you need to do. So go and be faithful. Be ambassadors of light and love wherever God brings you this week. Amen? Let's pray.